Welcome in to the Punt and Pass podcast. I'm your host, Drew Butler, joined alongside my co-host, Jake Fromm. Be sure to follow us on social media at Punt and Pass on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Drew Butler. He is at From Jake. Puntandpass.com, the number one destination for all things college football. Happy Labor Day, Jake, man. Long weekend, kind of crummy weather here in Atlanta, but the college football that we have been digesting since Thursday night. We have one more game tonight, Clemson, Georgia Tech. Dude, it's been awesome. I'm so fired up. Football is back. How are you doing? Dude, doing great. Had a great weekend. Glad football's back. Yeah. Put a little brisket on the grill. Had a good time with some friends. Nice. Uh, Man, it was awesome. Awesome weekend. I like that, dude. I have a pork butt that I'm about to throw on as soon as we're done taping this podcast today. Um, yeah, I mean, the football is unbelievable. We're going to get into all of that. We got a couple of news notes and headlines that uh, made some headway over the weekend. Of course, that's why you're here, punt and pass. But before we get there, this episode of Punt and Pass is presented to you by Solomon Brothers. That's right. Solomon Brothers Jewelers are back for the 2022 season of Punt and Pass. You probably know a lot about them already, but if you don't, I am here to tell you there is no place better than Solomon Brothers Jewelers, family-owned and operated since 1982. That's over 35 years. Solomon Brothers has the largest diamond and jewelry inventory in the Southeast. They have the lowest prices on the highest quality jewelry and diamonds guaranteed. They have the biggest selection. They have the best quality. It is the lowest prices. And here's the best part, Jake. The in-store experience that anybody has who goes into Solomon Brothers Jewelers is totally unmatched it is simply the best if you mention the punt and pass podcast or just mention myself or jake you can get 10 percent off your jewelry purchase the store is for anyone with any budget man i love solomon brothers i can't wait to get back in there you know jackie's pregnant again gonna have to get her another push present as they call it so i can't wait to go <laughs> see jaron and my like that I like that solomon brothers they have two locations one in alpharetta just past the avalon one in Buckhead, 17th floor, Tower Place in Buckhead, at Solomon Brothers on Instagram and Twitter, SolomonBrothers.com. Shout out to Solomon Brothers. They have been fantastic partners of the podcast. And we have some news. They're going to be giving some stuff away right here on Punt and Pass, October, November, and December. So stick around, Solomon Brothers, at Solomon Brothers on social media. All right, Jake, let's go three and out. The biggest news of the weekend before any of the games started, uh, and this will be first down, is the college football playoff is expanding to 12 teams. Uh, Crazy. Will, will happen by 2026. They said it could happen by 2024. 2024. But here's just the first thing I'll say, and then I want to get your thoughts and reactions. 12 teams, great, right? Awesome. Um, the number three team played the number 11 team <laughs> oh. this weekend, and it was 49 to Woo! three. So I don't know if this is problem solved. What are your initial thoughts? Yeah, I, I thought the timing of when they announced it was interesting. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's week one. Everybody's watching. Great time to tune in. So, you know, it's a great time, I guess, to announce it. Um, I think it would have benefited myself yeah. and, and Georgia for sure. You know, being that fifth team, that first team out, both, you know, the for two years. Um, so I would have definitely liked, you know, just give me a shot. Just give me a chance. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but, but we'll see. I, I think eight might've been better if we're just talking about just, you know, top to bottom, good football, but it's going to give, you know, guys a chance going to have your Cincinnati's, uh, more likely to get in, um, you know, just some different teams and we'll see. I, I it's going to come down to it, you know, Georgia versus Oregon, number three versus number 11, 49 to three, you know, I, as as yeah. as a Georgia fan, of course, <laughs> of course, you wanted that, but I, I'm gonna be honest, was not expecting that in any way, shape, or form. Came out. Not only did they have uh, defensive dominance, where they picked up where they left off last year, but the offense scored on the first seven drives of the football yeah. game. We'll probably touch on that a lot later, but wow, incredible. Yeah, it really was incredible. You're right. The timing was a little interesting right before the season started. I believe what they're doing is six conference champions, then six at-large bids, the teams Uh that I believe are the highest ranked who weren't the conference champions. Um, Here's my whole thing, and I've been saying this for years. We'll go to 12, people will start screaming for 16. We'll go to 16, people will start screaming for 24. It's never enough. It's never enough. And here is the difference between really college football, football in general, or any other sport like basketball, who obviously has a 68-team tournament. I don't know. You could be wrong. It would have to be the perfect storm, unlike basketball, where 
you know, basketball games have ebbs and flows. It's much mm-hmm. different. Um, mid-major teams can take down a Kentucky, St. Peter's against Kentucky. Yep. When you're talking about high-level college football, uh, the teams that usually are making it to the college football playoff, Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Notre Dame, Georgia, uh, LSU, when they get an opportunity to take on maybe the second or third best team in the Pac-12, uh, as it showed this past weekend, <laughs> it's different, right? I mean, think about – now, on the other side, let's think about the Utah-Florida game. We're going to talk yeah. about that in a little bit too. Yeah. Florida oh my unranked, uh, brand new head coach. That's... Question marks on offensive defense. Yeah. Utah, top 10 team, looking oh pretty my good. Gosh. They had to go into Florida. Now, granted, if that situation were in the college football playoff first round, it looks like that game would be in Salt Lake City. Uh-huh. Um, but you just don't see those massive, massive upsets like you can in a March Madness tournament in college football. Now, I don't want to hear about App State going into Michigan 100 yeah. years ago and beating them. Um, I don't want to hear about some of these other completely one-off upsets that you've seen in the past. I just am worried a little bit about the quality of the matchups if they continue to expand, which they will. And I guarantee you this will be a 12 team playoff by 2024. They're not going to wait. Oh yeah. No, they can't. So it, yeah, I, you may, yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, it, it could get ugly real quick, but you know, maybe uh, a number nine, you know, see the team makes it to the semifinal, you know, to the final four or something. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, the four highest ranked conference champions will be seated one through four with each receiving a first round by teams seated five through 12 will play each other in the first round on either the second or third weekend of December. The quarterfinals and semifinals will be played in bowl games on a rotating basis and the championship game will be at a neutral site as under the current 14 format. Now here's one more thing that I'll say. That's a lot of football. Okay. Especially in December. Guess what else is happening in December? Something called finals, right? These are student athletes. Let's not forget that, people. We all know how much money college football makes. We all see the TV contracts. Look, we get it. We're not going to beat that horse dead. It's already kaput. Here's the thing. There's a lot of other stuff going on. This creates much more stress, much more you know problems throughout the month of December. These kids are also trying to get ready for NFL careers. If they're in the college football playoff and they're playing on pre- probably pretty good teams, they have a good chance to go to the next level. Here's one thing that I don't think people are really thinking about. You elongate the postseason, okay? Take that 12th team against that five team. And and say the five team's really good, Texas A&M, Georgia, whoever it is. And the 12th team maybe is not really that good. Uh, And maybe there are some NFL-type caliber players who are going to have to get on the road, who are going to have to look at, hey, what happens if I do keep playing? I guarantee you, this is what I'm getting at. I guarantee you there will still be kids who sit out the playoff games. I guarantee it. There will still Sadly. be kids who Sadly. sit out the playoff games. I'm just telling you that right now. This is not the solution that people think it will be. We're always going to be clamoring for more. It is an imperfect system. But last thing, Jake, is the four really? Um, they hadn't really missed in the years past. The only complaint you can make is, hey, that 15 that was on the outside looking in, a couple of years you could, probably could have said, Hey, the four team got waxed by the one team in the semifinals. Probably the, Maybe the fifth. That matchup would have been a little bit better. Yeah, I, that that argument's very good. Um, glad you brought this up. Uh, hey, there's more football games at that time of the year. Tough on student athletes. They lose Christmas, lose seeing their families. I'm just telling you, um, it's tough. Who who who's who's now making more money to kind of even this this thing out? The NCA is now making their money. You know all the NIL stuff. So I mean, look, they're they're not dumb. They're they're smart about the way they're doing it. And just who's going to get compensated for what is you know biggest question mark. Shockingly, this is the most shocking quote in this entire article. The Pac-12 is strongly in favor of CFP expansion and welcomes <laughs> the decision of the yeah. CFP board. Yeah, no shit. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Welcome to the sure. party. Welcome yeah. to the party. And again, <laughs> it's like Alabama played Washington in 2015 in the Peach Bowl, and yeah. Alabama beat them like 38 nothing. I mean, come on, yeah. people. All right, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Let's go to second down. Let's um, do it. This was Thursday night or Friday night. Started getting hit up on social media, and L. Duncan uh, appeared on the Paul Feinbaum show, and she goes on this crazy rant, Jake, about you know she claims to be a Georgia fan. Um, we did some research. I don't even believe she went to Georgia. Not that that matters. She went to West Georgia. Good on you, L. You're up in Bristol. She's on Sports Center. She's repping the G. She loves the dogs. Hey, that's great. 
She goes on Feinbaum, and you know the crazy thing about Paul Feinbaum, like him, love him, hate him, indifferent, is he's so perpetually smug. You can never tell if he's being sarcastic or not. So you like have to read between the lines and go, is this true? For is sure. this false? Is he having fun? Is he not? Yep. But L. Duncan goes on there, and it was a kind of season preview. Hey, what are you expecting from Jordan this weekend against Oregon? And she goes on this rant about, I have no idea why Stetson Bennett came back to Georgia. What more does he have to prove? I mean, why wouldn't he just have left after last year? She asks the question, is he a sadist? I'm going, what the what? hell is going on? <laughs> what is and then going she says on? she compares Stetson winning a national championship last year to her four-year-old spelling the word mom, essentially saying, hey, I was so proud that she spelled the word, but I wouldn't expect her to know how to do it again. And I'm going, this is crazy. Oh, what? And Paul Feinbaum's like playing around with it and. And he's kind of like, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure he's just poking the bear, egging yeah, it on, you know, bringing more questions in. And I'm yeah. sitting here going, I've got to be missing something. I go, this, I watched it about five times. I go, I've got to be missing something. So what did I do? Um, I went to Twitter and I just tagged got L to. Duncan and I go, did, did you just compare Stetson Bennett winning a national championship to your four-year-old spelling mom? Did you really just call him a sadist? What am I missing? I, I asked, <laughs> what am I missing? This is crazy talk. And she hits me back and she's like, you don't get it. And I go, I mean, please explain it to me. That's why I'm asking please. you. Yeah, we're asking. She's like, do you not watch me on Paul Feinbaum? I go, surely I do. I mean, I always have SEC Network on the TV. She's like, it's a it's a bit. It's a shtick. You know, it's what I do. I'm a, you know, narcissistic, fatalist Georgia fan. And I, 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 I go, okay. I mean, that shtick is over though, Jake. The dogs won the national championship last year. <laughs> Stetson Bennett played, you know, in the fourth quarter at a very high level. Yeah. Um, that song and dance just doesn't carry the same weight as it used to. It was just really, really bizarre to be a hundred percent honest with you. Yeah, no, I, I look, I agree. Uh, I, I hate, I missed it. Gosh, I was not paying attention. Um, but gosh, this just, it sounds weird. It sounds a little, maybe kind of off, off topic a little bit, but so, wow. I mean, that, that's, that was just, I don't know. I, I don't know how to, how to explain that one. No, no, neither do I. And like, that's why I literally had to, um, I had to reach out to her. I go, well, this is crazy. Like explain yourself because we're Georgia fans, for answers. you know, people were hitting me up. Georgia fans were hitting me up. Like what in the world is this? Um, calling him a sadist. I was like, this is freaking crazy. So I just said, I go, I'm confused. I've, I've watched this thing multiple times. Like what is going on? Um, and she says, winning a championship has not changed me. I am forever the cynic. It's my kind of thing. Okay. All right, L. Duncan. All right. <laughs> we'll get to that because Stetson Bennett went uh, bananas in the bends this Off past weekend against Oregon. So we're almost there. Let's hit up third down really quick. It's on this topic. It's talking about the SEC quarterbacks. They look dominant this week. I mean, yeah, uh, Bryce Young against Utah State. Defending Heisman Trophy champion, he had 195 passing yards, five touchdowns, 100 rushing yards, yeah. an additional touchdown on the ground. Uh, we'll talk about Anthony Richardson. People are crowning him the king after one game against Utah. Stetson, 25 and 31, 368, two touchdowns, one rushing touchdown. Hendon Hooker on Thursday night. I mean, it, SEC looks like they're in pretty good shape um, yeah. as of now, but these QBs, Jake, they look dominant. Yeah, no, I completely agree, man. Stetson, what a game. Uh, arguably the best of his career. Um, wow. I mean, I thought he looked good. I thought he looked in command. Yeah. Uh, the ball was being, you know, delivered on time. Good decisions. You know, I love I love Stetson to death, but, you know, usually when Stetson plays, he has one or two plays where it's like, oh, Stetson. Yeah, yeah, a little head scratcher, a little bonehead play. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. You know, I, I saw a, a mature decision maker – who was, you know, managing the game and taking care of the game into his own hands and putting his team in just great situations. Um, I, I thought the uh, the play he made was an extended play. He yeah. got outside the pocket and, in, and just knows he's just about to get hammered here, delivers a strike about 30 yards away to AD on the sideline. I mean, I, look, that's a, a next-level play right there. That just was a penalty – and a completion. I mean, oh, it yeah. all happened. Yeah, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. No, I thought that was awesome. Uh, the one thing I did think was uh, pretty funny when I was watching the game, uh, when he threw the touchdown to Ladd on the scramble, where he came back over, 
I, I'm 99% sure he was throwing to Darnell and then just yeah, Lad, I think that's Lad just I, I agree with that. There. It's like, oh, oh, I don't think Darnell go. saw it. Yeah, I don't yeah. think Darnell saw it because yeah. the ball kind of whizzed by his face mask and yeah. Lad was right behind him. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I was like, I think oh that's yeah, true. that ball is that ball is definitely for Darnell. I got got a little lucky with that one, but hey man, when you're balling, you're balling. Let's that's go. That's right. That's right. No, we'll get to that because I, I got I was at the game. Um, awesome uh-huh. atmosphere. We'll touch on that in just a little bit. But Stetson, I text somebody after the game. I go, he looks like he's 25 or 30. I mean, I think he is 25. He looks like he's 30 years old out there. He's so confident. He's so calm. Yeah. Nothing shakes him. Every, yeah. The game looks really slow to him, which is obviously a huge advantage for a quarterback. But um, all right. Yeah, that's a three and out. Oh, one more quick thing. Before before we get into uh, how I went 0-5 against the spread this week, worst start I've ever had in punt and pass history. Uh, look, I'll address it. I- I'm a man. I'll stand up. I'll face the music. But um, right before noon on Saturday, my phone starts blowing up and people, you know, they listen to the pod earlier in the week and they hear us talking about Lee Corso. And I guess, you know, Corso still on. I'm, I'm going, gosh, guys, guys, here's my last thing. OK, look, I know he's 87. It's a, it's remarkable that he's on TV. It really is. It's unbelievable. Agree, and I'm 100 percent. I'm not complaining about somebody on TV talking about football. I'm not. I'm just saying for uh, the viewing audience, here's what I really am getting towards. And tell me if I'm wrong. I'm going to go way out of left field here. I like Kirk Herbstreit. I, I really do like Kirk Herbstreit. I think I he's love Kirk. phenomenal. Yeah. Do you think, and this is sort of conspiracy theory-ish, do you think there is at all a reason as to why Lee Corso is still on game day? Do you think that Kirk Herbstreit, I mean, he babysits for all mm-hmm. intents and purposes. Do you think Herbstreit wants Corso to be in that chair next to him? Um, makes Herbstreit look really good. Right. Herb Street looks like the smartest guy in the room. There's no doubt about it. And if Corso wasn't there, who's coming up next to him? Maybe it's David Pollock a little bit more regularly. Maybe it's Jesse Palmer, who I think is really good, who's in the studio all weekends. I'm a big Bachelor and Bachelorette fan as well. I think he stepped in nicely for Chris Harrison. Um, Think about somebody like Brock Osweiler, who ESPN just hired. Tall, West Coast guy. Got some good insight on quarterback play and, and college football in general. That would be a threat to Kirk Herbstreit. Those guys would be a threat to Kirk Herbstreit. Kirk Herbstreit costs a lot of money, okay? And if ESPN were to start seeing some younger, cheaper guys sit next to him and possibly mix it up a little bit, um, those execs start thinking. So I don't know, people. I don't know. He's 87 years old. Jake and I told you last week what they should have done is create like a retirement tour for Lee Corso, do 15 mascot headgear things. Everybody gets to celebrate him. And then we can kind of usher in some new talent on college game day. But that is my conspiracy theory. I love Kirk Herbstreet. I'm just putting some pieces together here, Jake. It it does not make sense to me. I think it's a security blanket for Kirk Herbstreet. Um, And I think if Lee Corso were not there and we're just doing the mascot headgear piece, Somebody could be sitting next to Herbie and threatening for some of those big dollars that he's getting from ESPN. Yeah. Am I, I, am I look, crazy? Look, I, I love Kirk, but I think you make some very great and valid points. Okay. I, I mean, I do, uh, you know, just, uh, I mean, the comparison I have is kind of Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love situation, you know, yeah. I, I just, you know, yeah. I, you know, just, just QBs and, and backup QBs. It's like, Hey, you know, why do we have them? So, just you just try to not not have good backup QB. So I look, I, I get it. I see it. I think you make some great points. And all right. Only time will tell. All right. Let's start talking about uh what we saw on the field this past weekend because it was phenomenal. And we got to break it so, down. Yes, I know I went 0 5 against the spread on my picks, but I picked a couple of winners if you were looking at some money line action. Uh, but before we get to that, again, we have to give a huge shout out to our presenting sponsors of this podcast. And it's none other than Solomon Brothers Jewelers. Solomon Brothers Jewelers, two locations, one in Alpharetta, just past the Avalon, the other in Buckhead, 17th floor, Tower Place. What's the best part about Solomon Brothers? Solomon Brothers is for anyone with any budget. And get this, if you head over there and you mention the Punt and Pass podcast or you mention Jake Fromm or myself, you can get 10% off your jewelry purchase. Solomon Brothers has the largest diamond and jewelry inventory in the Southeast. I'm telling you right now, if you go in there and you're a guy, they have an unbelievable watch selection. I have an Oris GMT Aquas watch from Solomon Brothers. It is so sick. I get compliments on it. All the time. They have custom jewelry design. They offer interest-free financing options, lifetime diamond upgrades. Again, beautiful stores, beautiful service. 
SolomonBrothers.com at Solomon Brothers on Twitter and Instagram. Jake and I will be heading into Solomon Brothers here in a couple of weeks. Um, and Jake, you'll so, love it. I'm telling you right I'm, now, you. I'm in. Loving. I'm in need of a nice watch, love man. Let's yeah, go buddy. That. Yeah, buddy. You will be getting one for sure. All right, quickly inside the five recap. We kept it in the SEC. Generally speaking, 3:30 p.m. on ESPN. Cincinnati against Arkansas. Arkansas gets out of there with the win. They beat Cincinnati 31 to 24. The line there was six and a half. So Arkansas covered. Jake, you picked that game correctly. Ooh, so you, hat Jesus. tip to you, my friend. But you know, uh, I thought KJ Jefferson, Sam Pittman, that Arkansas team. I thought it was a really Cincinnati. good game. It was yeah. a really good game. Yeah. I like Cincinnati against Power Five teams. Uh, yep. They were just missing that one play late in the game to kind of keep it close, maybe press yep. it into overtime. And they, and they and they and Cincinnati came back. They were down yeah. at halftime. So yeah. I mean, look, that's kind of what you expect. Twenty three versus nineteen coming out of the gate, week one, good football game. Uh, glad we saw it. Glad Pittman and the Hogs came out on top. Yeah, I mean, what a gem that guy is. His post game interview, They're like, what are you gonna do? He's like, you know, I'm not promoting it, but I'm gonna go <laughs> get me some old <laughs> cold beer. I'm like, this guy's, <laughs> Dude, like this guy is the best. Like this guy is the best. Like he fits in so well with Arkansas, and obviously oh, yeah. in Arkansas, there's nothing else there. So they are the professional sports team, Arkansas football, especially when they're good. Oh, um, yeah. So I know everybody continues to root for Arkansas. Man, I thought Cincinnati was gonna keep that close though. Um, watch out for Cincinnati though. Again, if they run the table in the American Athletic Conference. Uh, they can hang their hat on keeping it close on the road. Keeping with it SEC close, team. you know. I I think Arkansas is only going to move up, maybe end up somewhere around you know eleven or you know somewhere between ten and fifteen. Probably finish up, you know, as far as rank wise. So. Uh, I think that's a respectable loss for Cincinnati. Could end up moving in there. Who knows? No doubt, no doubt. So Jake gets on the board one and zero in inside the five with a winner against the spread, picking Arkansas nice. in the six and a half. All right, let's go to the Chick Fil A kickoff game. I was there. We'll touch on it right now. Number eleven, Oregon taking on number three, Georgia, 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 Georgia. Uh, the line was seventeen and a half when we picked it. I think it closed at sixteen and a half. Here's what I thought. I thought Oregon was a little bit better. Man, they looked awful. Georgia looked dominant. They were dominant. Yeah. They were phenomenal, firing on all cylinders. They went 49 to three. Three. Um, Jake, this was about as good as the dogs looked with as many expectations and as many, you know, I don't even know what the other word to be would would, would it, there was just a lot on the line coming back oh, from oh yeah. Tell me, please. Talk to me. I look. Dude, completely agree. Expectations high, and they, I mean, raised their bar yeah. and delivered. I mean, I was not expecting it. As any Georgia fan, this is what you just wanted, obviously. But I could not honestly tell you I expected this. I did not. I mean, I thought Oregon was going to throw a few touchdowns. thought Bo was going to play a little better. I thought they'd have a better plan offensively. Yeah. You know, I just, ah, just, it just didn't, ah, it just didn't look good to me. Um, you know, the, and the then it, Go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was you know, going to say, the, the field goal that they got, they had like 47 penalty yards to get down into field goal range. Like, that. that's how they yeah. got down the field. There was two personal right. fouls and a holding. Uh, but keep going. Yeah, and, and I don't know. Just, um, you know, Bo had two tournaments. I thought the two interceptions we had on defense were awesome. Great, Malachi Starks. Great picks. Yeah, you know, the one was a, a super athletic play, ball skills going up. Um, and the other one was, you know, basically a tape and reading eyes pick, you know, where he he jumps her out. Um, and I thought he was going to take it to the house. Uh, it was really close. But, I mean, dude, the dogs played well. I, I think they won in all three phases of the game. Uh, and now, uh, watching the post-game interview, did you see what uh, uh, Kirby said about, no. uh, about Oregon? About he, the he better was, players thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he was, yeah. He, he, you know, he was uh, – actually, me and Caroline were talking about this driving home, but he, he was – Trying to stick up for Lanning. Yeah, of course. You know, which I, I mean, I, I think you know, him in that position, I, I would, you know, stick up for Lanning too. But, you know, it's, I, it's, it's the truth. It just, it just hurts to hear sometimes. It reminded me of um, the post game press conference that Shane Beamer had last year uh, when South Carolina came to Athens in week two or three. And it was just an all out route. And Shane Beamer was like, guys, what do you expect us to do? You know, we're just trying to recruit new guys. They're shuffling in five stars off the bench. Yeah. We can't compete with that. Essentially, what he was saying, like, yeah. I can't run the ball. They're like, why don't you try to run the ball? He's like, you can't. They've got Jordan <laughs> Davis, Devontae Wyatt, Nicobe D. Like, he's like, that's not how football works. Right. Yeah. So I thought it was smart of Kirby to just say, hey, you know what? Like, we executed really well. We had yeah. a great game plan. The guys played their asses off. 
But simply put, we have better players. And Coach Landing knows that. And that's probably the message that Coach Landing gave to the Oregon team. Hey, guys, way to put your hand in the pile. I'm glad you didn't quit. That is a championship caliber football team. That is what we want to become. That is what we're aspiring to become. So, it, again, it well, 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 we will learn a lot about the makeup of that team and the culture of that team. Uh, of Oregon, you know, yeah. talking about Oregon um, in the next few weeks and see how they respond to it. Cause that was a beat down. Yeah, that was a beat down. Um, Bo Nix, 21 of 37, 173 yards, two interceptions. Um, he did go over his prize pick rushing projection. He had eight carries for 37 yards. He was Stetson, under on the passing yards. I know, Gosh, man. man. I know, I, right that, that hurt, we that, that hurt me so bad. I know. That me hurt. too. Me too. Stetson, though, again, 25 of 31, 368, two touchdowns. Eight, uh, sorry, where it was his rushing yards. He had another rushing touchdown as well. Two carries, yep. eight yards, one rushing touchdown. Kenny McIntosh getting out of the backfield, leading the receiving charge. Nine catches, 117 yards. Lab McConkey obviously making it happen. He had five catches, 73 yards, and a touchdown. It's crazy because everybody gave the tight end so much love. You forget about all the other talent out there. Yeah, that's absolutely. really what showed up. Oh yeah, and then uh, I, I saw a stat somewhere as well. I, you know, I, I don't want to get this percentage mixed up, but it was a very large percentage of the passing yards came out after the catch, you know, and that's going back to Kenny catching those swing routes. Short to rails and, and, out of the yeah, backfield. And, yeah, and, and, you know, taking care of business once they have the ball in their hands. So that definitely helps, man. Yeah, Malachi Starks really made a name for himself with that super Big athletic time. catch and, and playing good in the defensive backfield. Chris Smith had yep. an interception as well. It's great to see him. Didn't he have an interception as well? I think yeah, Christopher I Smith had an Chris. interception. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's yeah. one that almost he was the one that jumped that route. back to the house and jumped that route. Um, last thing that I want to mention: Kenny McIntosh versus Kendall Milton out of the backfield. I like Kenny McIntosh. I like the way he runs the ball. I, I like Kenny. the style that he can run. Kendall to me seems a bit. Um, he runs very upright. He, he his body posture likens him to get tackled easily. Here's yeah. what I saw from Kendall, right? His touchdown run where the pocket collapsed. What did he do? He got low, he uh -huh. made a guy miss. He was super athletic, got out to the pylon and scored a touchdown. I go, wow, that was the best run he's had, uh, maybe at Georgia, and he was forced to get low. Um, Kenny runs with that kind of lean. I think of guys mm -hmm. like Sony. I think of guys yep. like Nick Chubb, where it was like, get out of the way. These guys are athletic. They're yeah. strong. I don't see that running style from Kendall Milton yet. Hopefully he learns a little bit from Kenny because it certainly seemed like Kenny said, this is my job for right now. Yeah. Yeah, when you know when I was there, Kenny would be a, an off returner um, on special teams on kickoff return. And Kenny, whenever he got the ball in his hands, you know, man, he he would just you know shifty, can make things yeah. you know make guys miss and, and things like that. So love Kenny. I think I think he's great in just this new era of college football, shotgun stuff like that. And you know, uh, I, I think versatile Kendall, by yeah, committee. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think Kendall. You know, I I don't want to compare him to Derrick Henry because. Uh, you know, I, th I think we got a long way to go. I can see that. I know, yeah. But, but I, I think he may be more of a under center wide zone kind of guy. Um, you know, just, just, you know, he, he may need that, that under under center type of style to, to see it, to read it and to get going. Cause I think once he gets going, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think it'd be great and getting low and, and things like that. I, I was a little disappointed. He had a run uh, going into the end zone and he gets tackled on like the one yard line. You know, it's like, hey, yeah. man, George running backs, we just, we don't, we don't get tackled on the know. line, you know? know? And so I thought he had an easy walk and touchdown gets tackled, but, uh, you know, hey, he's young, got a long way to go, and he's all going to get better from here. Absolutely. Um, we were both wrong on this one. We thought it'd be a little bit closer. Again, I don't think that was any knock on Georgia. I just thought Oregon would show up, maybe score a touchdown. Yeah. Um, and as I we I said, I, I, I but I I took UGA in the spread on that one though, right? Did you? No, I think you took, I mean, I had, uh, we'll have to go back and listen. I've got Oregon plus 17 and a half from you. You said Georgia was going to win. I'll go back and listen, okay? I don't want you to get mad at me. No. I'll go back and listen, and oh. I'll make sure of it, okay? All right. And if All there's right, some coach. discrepancy, we'll let the audience pick to see right. who was All right. right. Um, yeah, going back to that, though, and then we're going to move on to the Utah-Florida game. Yeah. This is the conundrum that you will be in now that you are an esteemed member of the media. If you uh, try to go against the grain and you say, well, you know – First game, Georgia's got a lot of expectations. I think they're going to keep it close. Uh -huh. You're wrong. Um, and you tried to go against the grain to not be biased towards Georgia. 
but then you're wrong, right? <laughs> so then if you're on the other side and you're like, George, think about this. If you yeah. would have come out on Tuesday or myself and been like, Georgia is going to beat the dog Just out of Oregon. Oregon won't even score 50 to nothing. People will be like, Jake Fromm is crazy. He's biased. He can't see through yeah. his own, you know, prejudice. But then it happens. Nobody uh-huh. would ever give you, no, nobody would ever, ever give you the, the, the proper the props respect. you deserved yeah absolutely not like, oh he got yeah. lucky All right so yeah. that's just where you're at now guess, guess what i'm gonna do for the rest of the season oh, george sure. is gonna beat the brakes off everybody off everybody i like it yeah are you kidding me kentucky who they play i mean they played somebody i mean what are we even talking Look, about georgia has a very very manageable schedule yeah. from here on out so yeah. we'll see you know we'll see it's just it's just but, but go go back to the hey look i I don't – I personally don't care. I was a quarterback at the University of Georgia for three years. Amen. <laughs> you're just you're just going to face heat no matter what you say. Yeah. I don't care. Oh, and yeah. I, and I'm always, I'm always going to shoot you straight what I think. I'm not going to lie That's to what you. We I need. can care less. That's what we need. Yeah, Kentucky beats Miami of Ohio 37-13. to 13. Good job, guys. You're really – yeah, I'm scared. Big thumbs up, guys. I can't stand Kentucky. All right, Utah, Florida, one of the best games of the weekend. Yep. Florida wins 29 to 26. Great atmosphere at home. Cam Rising and Utah get the ball back late, drive all the way down the field, the go way. for the kill shot to win. And he throws an interception from, I believe, the two yard line or the six yeah. yard line. Um, Anthony That's Richardson. Pick we cover. I mean, come yeah, on. I know. Anthony Richardson getting a lot of love. He had three rushing yeah. touchdowns, 11 carries 106 yards three rushing touchdowns the two-point conversion play was pretty damn spectacular where the pocket collapsed he like yep. jumps up into the defender spins off of him runs out tosses it to the back pylon back corner pylon wide open um, receiver but a huge victory for billy napier and company huge. um That's and man deal. utah yep. utah really dropped the ball there man yeah, no, I definitely think so. I mean, testament to coming into the swamp, playing in the swamp, man. It was tough. It was hot. Absolutely. Uh, loud. I mean, hey, uh, they had it rocking. Ah, man, I, I I hate I missed this one. You know, Utah, they don't throw the pick. You know, they, they cover and all that good stuff. But, I know. hey, it, it, it is what it is. But, I mean, hey, what's Florida going to be this year? You know, uh, Anthony Richardson played well. I'm going to have to see more to, yeah. to be a true believer in it. But uh, I think uh, grass could be green down there. It could be. Um, could be. I'm still a little bit hesitant to stamp an approval on the defense. I mean, yeah, Tavion Thomas, 23 carries, 115 yards, and a touchdown for Utah. Yep. Brant Quyth, uh, nine catches, 105 yards, and a touchdown. So Utah was getting the ball up and down the field. They just yeah. weren't converting. Now, can you give Florida's defense credit for them not converting? Certainly. Uh, that interception at the end of the game to seal the victory – Absolutely. But I just think there'll be growing pains at times. Um, mm-hmm. I, I This is a huge victory, not only for Florida, but for the SEC. This one really, really stung the Pac-12. USC now seems like they will be the class of that conference if they can run the table. Now they can't mess up. But, uh, you know, Utah's a good team. I mean, give them a lot of credit. Give Florida a ton of credit for yeah. getting a huge victory. I would expect them to sneak probably into the top 25 after knocking off a top 10 team. Um, certainly an advantage of them playing at home. Yep. But, hey, Billy Napier, shout out to you, man. Congrats. Uh, we're going to need to see more out of Anthony Richardson. Can he continue to replicate this? The Tebow comparisons, the Cam Newton comparisons. Let's just chill yeah, out for a second. I, yeah, I, I saw it. Chill yeah, out for I, two I, seconds. I, I read, saw something about that, you know, where he's better than Tebow, you know, better runner than Cam, could throw it better than somebody. I'm like, oh, all right. Guys. <laughs> I mean, let's Eey, just chill oh, for two oh, seconds, okay? Oh, oh. Two right. seconds. It's September the 5th. Let's, <laughs> let's hang on. Yeah. So, well, we'll, shout we'll out see to Florida, on. though. Yeah. Shout yeah. out to Florida. You and I are both wrong. We were both on Utah there. I thought Utah would win the game straight up. And I thought if they were going to score that touchdown at the end, they were going to cover as well. Uh, great game, though. Watch out for Florida. Watch out for Florida. They'll be playing Tennessee Great. here in just a couple of weeks. Number five, Notre Dame at number two, Ohio State. Wow, this one, um, I was expecting Ohio State to blast Notre Dame. I got to give a ton of credit to the Fighting Irish, to Coach Marcus Freeman. Marcus they kept Freeman. this game close. Yep. They really limited what Ohio State could do with all that firepower on offense. They tried as hard as they could to make it happen, but you and I talked about it. Uh, new offensive coordinator, Tyler Buckner getting his first start. It was just going to be a big ask, and I thought Ohio State's defense showed up pretty well also. Ohio new State DC. wins 21-10. to 10. Yeah, I slightly disappointed. I, you know, like you said, I, I thought this was 
going to be a blowout. Don't need to say anything about it. I thought Georgia versus Oregon and the Notre Dame-Ohio State game, I thought the two outcomes of those games were going to be flipped. Yes, very well said. I, I, that's just w- the way I, I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah, I, you know, Ohio State, I thought they tried to run the ball a little bit. Uh, I, you know, and, Travion uh, Henderson's a great running back. We'll see how yeah. that kind of continues yeah. to matriculate throughout the season. But a balanced attack from Ohio State is probably what's most deadly. I mean, if everybody knows you're yeah. just going to air it out, then you know you can scheme up a defense to somewhat keep the top on the defense. But yeah. once you get Travion Henderson going, man, and they have to respect the run game, that's when they can become very, very dangerous. And it seemed like Notre Dame was prepared for all of that. They kept it close. I don't say this often, but hats off to Notre Dame. That was a pretty impressive showing by them. Hats off. I, I thought so. Um, it didn't help Ohio State with uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba. Mm-hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, he, you know, he kind of got banged up there early, and you know, kind of he he came back. And I don't know really how much he played after that. I don't think he had too much production, but um, yeah, I, I'm curious to see where Ohio State goes from here. You know, how they build on it. Are they going to be kind of shaky all year? Where they they'll win all their games. But it may not be as clean as, you know, you once thought they were, but we'll see. Yeah, they're usually like first early part of the season, just hammer them against the spread because they score 60, They their defense yeah. shows up. So we'll see. They'll play some lesser opponents now. But Notre Dame, um, I was dogging them heading into that matchup, and they oh, showed true. some teeth. So good for them. Now they have to go perfect through the rest yeah. of the season. As they know, you know, they were big fans of the CFP moving to 12 also. <laughs> Notre sure. Dame and the Pac-12, two, <laughs> two big proponents of that move. All right, then last game, last night's game, Ooh. I fell asleep like twice. Jackie had to wake me up. This is crazy. Wake up. Florida State against LSU in Caesar Superdome in New Orleans. What a game. Florida State <laughs> wins 24 to 23. They were up big. LSU yeah. comes charging back. Muffed punt with two minutes left. Florida State gets on it. They're going to put it in the end zone and put this game out of reach. They run a toss sweep on the one-yard line. The running back fumbles it. LSU gets on it. So now they have to go 98 yards in a minute. Sure enough, they do. They're going to tie it up. Score. They score a touchdown. it gets the PAT block. I mean, special teams catastrophes, one after the other for LSU. That, of course, is an execution. Um that 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 is on the execution from the players, but the coaching, man, you got to get these guys locked in there. What yeah. happened on there was a a blocked field goal earlier in the game for LSU. I okay. think they muffed two punts. Um, both they were uh, what's muffed the guy's two. name? Um, I'm missing the guy's name. Uh, Number eight, neighbors, I I, neighbors, yeah, yeah. neighbors. Uh, and then they get an extra point block. So the far left end on the extra point field goal protection team, what you're supposed to do is step outside and push your right hand inside, right? You just mm-hmm. close the gap. It all happens so quick. Snap to kick is 1.3 seconds or less. So essentially, all you have to do is touch the guy, just and he will way. get somewhat knocked off and won't be able to get to the block point. Well, he steps left to block the outside guy and just doesn't even give anything into the inside gap. Florida State defender runs through it, blocks it at the point, and they lose the game. 24 to 23. Brian Kelly at halftime was like, well, we're not playing good. We need to play better. I'm like, great insight. Thanks, coach. After the game, he's like, that wasn't good. We need to be better. I'm like, awesome. LSU fans will be riding on Brian Kelly oh, all season long. Oh. They should have won that game. That was a catastrophe of epic proportion. Good for Florida State. Yeah, great for Florida State. Uh, I mean, I thought they did some really good things. Uh, they definitely capitalized a lot on LSU's mistakes and turnovers and this and that. Going back to Brian Kelly, I, I think they're going to ride him hard all, all yeah. season. I think they're going to come back to this one. You know, every game they lose from here on out, which, you know, they're going to lose a few more games from here, and they're going to come back to this one. And uh, I just think this is the start of the mess. Yeah, it the, could be. The debacle. Um, the, quick, I believe, the quick debacle. I believe their total for the season was like five and a half, six and a half wins. Um, I think they go over that, man, but I expected them to beat Florida State. I got to give a lot, of sh- a lot of credit to Jordan Travis, though, Florida State's quarterback. Yep. He was calm and composed, 20 of 32, 260 yards and two touchdowns. Jaden Daniels looked good, too, for LSU, the transfer from Arizona State, 26 yeah. of 35, 209, two touchdowns. He also carried the ball 16 times for 114 yards, so he can get outside the pocket. What a crazy game this was, though. 
absolutely crazy. LSU, man, the one SEC team that lost this weekend was LSU, and they should have won. They snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory in that game. But um, we got one more game tonight. Clemson, Georgia Tech inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, I would expect Clemson to win. I will not give you a pick. I need a little bit of a breather. I'm 0-5. We'll <laughs> we, 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 we got to we'll we'll lick our wounds, lab, both yeah. of us, man. We yeah, get back that was rough. Lab. Um, you're going to go play golf today. It's Labor Day. Hopefully yeah, this man. weather hangs out. I'm going to put that pork butt on the rec tech, hang out with the kids. Let's go. Chill. So um, anything on the way out, my man? No, man. Hopefully I'll play good today. Gonna play with some old heads today. All right. They asked me what my hand. They asked me what my handicap was. Hey, look, you know, you always gotta tell them. You gotta get it way over. Though. Yeah, yeah, it's way yeah. over. I, I, I do have to get a handicap. I, yeah. Look, the the last couple times I've played, it's been pretty, pretty well. So um, you're we're a talking, sandbagger. We're talking low eighties. Okay. Like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So ho- hopefully they don't listen to this. You know, before, no. before. So. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm trying, I'm trying to put it to him this afternoon. No question. Um, I have sent over the email list to Rec Tech, so be on the lookout for that. They will pick a winner for our Rec Tech giveaway, which Let's is go. unbelievable. Thanks to everybody Huge. who joined in. Speaking of giveaways, we're going to have more giveaways in the next couple of weeks from the presenting sponsor of this podcast. That, of course, is none other than Solomon Brothers Jewelers, the largest diamond and jewelry inventory in the Southeast. Mention Punt and Pass or Drew and Jake for 10% off your jewelry purchase. Follow them on social media at Solomon Brothers on Instagram and Twitter, SolomonBrothers.com. Solomon Brothers has the lowest prices on the highest quality jewelry and diamonds, guaranteed. That is right. They had the biggest selection, the best quality, the lowest prices, and an in-store experience that is totally unmatched. Two locations, one in Alpharetta just past the Avalon, the other in Buckhead, 17th floor, Tower Place. Shout out to Solomon Brothers. Keep it locked in right here. We'll let you know about those giveaways coming up. Keep it locked into us on social media as well at Punt and Pass on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Drew Butler. He is at From Jake. Puntandpass.com. Looking forward to week two of college football. We got some great matchups, and we will talk to you on Thursday. See you. How about them dogs?